Here are the sample problems for class 14 of Math 117. And the first of these is the intermediate value theorem. Um, you're undoubtedly familiar with the theorem, but you may not ever have proved it, and you very likely haven't proved it using Deneen's definition of continuity. So let me set the stage for this. There's the x-axis. Here's an interval that extends from A to B. We have to assume that the function f has values of opposite sign at A and at B, and there's no loss in generality of, in assuming that f of A is positive while f of B is negative. f is a continuous function, so it'll stay positive for a while as we go beyond A. Sooner or later it has to go negative, but it could come back up into positive territory for a while, and eventually it will end up at its negative value at B. Now, I'm going to define a set, capital A, to be the set of all x's in the interval from A to B with the property that all the way from A to x, the function f has a positive value. In other words, it's x with the property that f of y is greater than or equal to 0 throughout the interval from A to X. That means that this part of the interval is in this set A here, although the function values are positive, this portion of the axis is not in A because we don't have positive values all the way from A up to here. Okay, this set of real numbers is non-empty because it contains the value A. It's bounded above by the value B, and therefore it has a least upper bound. I'll give that a name. The supremum, or least upper bound, of these sets is the value that I'll call C. Now what I want to do is build sequences so that I can apply Deneen's definition of continuity. And to get things started, I'm going to invoke the so-called Archimedean property of real numbers. What Archimedes says is that no matter how small a real number you have, b minus a, I can always find some integer n0 that's so large that when I multiply it by that b minus a, I get something that exceeds any given real number. But in this particular case, all I want it to do is to exceed 1. Why did I do that? Because then b minus a is greater than 1 over n0. And if I look at a plus 1 over n, that's going to be less than b for all n greater than, or for that matter, equal to n0. So now I have a way of creating a sequence of numbers that all lie in the interval from a to b. 
Now, tricky part of the proof. I have to rule out the possibility that C equals A, or equivalently, that the set A contains only the single value A. In other words, that the function F is positive at A, but is negative everywhere else on the interval from A to B. And you look at it and you say, that's impossible. Why is it impossible? It's impossible because f is continuous. If the function abruptly dropped down to negative values after being positive at a, it would be discontinuous. That's fine, but we have to turn it into a rigorous argument. And the way we do that is to create a sequence. I'll create a sequence whose nth element, x sub n, is somewhere in between a and a plus 1 over n, such that f of x over n is less than 0. In other words, if there are no values except for little a in the set capital A, given any interval just to the right of A, I can always find an x sub n where the function f has a negative value. OK, if f of x sub n is less than or equal to 0, then the limit of f of x sub n must be less than or equal to 0. The limit of the sequence of negative numbers cannot be positive. Now I use the fact that f is continuous. That means that when I consider f of a, bearing in mind that a is the limit of this sequence f, this sequence x sub n, so f of a is f of the limit of x sub n, and now I use Deneen's continuity criterion. f is a continuous function if the function of the limit of a sequence is equal to the limit of the function values. In other words, for a continuous function, I can move the limit outside, and that means that f of a is less than or equal to 0, which of course contradicts my original assumption that f of a was greater than 0. And by an argument that's so similar, I'm not going to repeat it. I'm going to rule out the possibility that c is equal to b. So now we know that this value c, where we're going to prove that f is 0, is somewhere in the interior of the interval. Now we're going to make another sequence. Let me call this sequence S sub n. It's C minus 1 over n. And if I choose n greater than n naught, then S sub n is guaranteed to be greater than a. So this is a sequence of points all in my interval. And what matters about it, of course, is that the limit of this sequence, as n goes to infinity, is, I don't want c. Yes, I do. The limit of this sequence is c. Okay, 
what do we know about c minus 1 over n? Well, it's somewhere in between a and c, and that means that the function value has to be positive because the interval from a to c is one on which the function f is never negative. So I can say f of s sub n is greater than or equal to 0. And now I exploit the fact that f is continuous. I say that f of c is therefore f of the limit of s sub n, which is equal to the limit of f of s sub n. And since all the f of f sub n values are greater than or equal to 0, this must be, in turn, greater than or equal to 0. OK, I'm making progress. I've now shown that f of c is greater than or equal to 0. But I want to prove that it's equal to 0. What am I going to do? Of course, I'm going to prove that it's also less than or equal to 0. We already know that c is not equal to b. It's less than b. So I choose a point in a new sequence. I'll use y sub n, since that's what Deneen uses. And I'm going to choose this in between c and c plus 1 over n in such a way that f of y sub n is less than 0. In other words, if I go somewhat to the right of c, I could go fairly far to the right, I can always find values where f is less than 0 in that interval. Otherwise, c wouldn't have been the least upper bound of the set a. Now notice I've set things up so that this sequence has a limit of c. And now I use continuity again. I say f of c is f evaluated at the point that's the limit of the sequence y sub n, and therefore it's equal to the limit of f of y sub n. But since f of y sub n is less than, less than 0, its limit is less than or equal to 0. In other words, f of c is greater than or equal to 0, and I'm done. I proved that f of c is both greater than or equal to 0 and less than or equal to 0. In other words, that it's equal to 0. Well, after that real analysis, it's a relief to get back to some nice, easy algebra. And the first thing I want to prove is that you can calculate the variance of a random variable by taking the expectation of the square minus the square of the expectation. So I'm going to start with the definition of variance. The variance sigma sub x squared of random variable x is defined to be the expectation of the square of the difference between x and its own expectation. In other words, it's defined to be the expectation of x squared minus 2 mu sub x times x plus 
mu sub x squared. Expectation is linear, so I'll exploit the linearity of expectation to get variance is equal to the expectation of x squared, that's the first term, minus 2 times the constant mu sub x times the expectation of x plus the expectation of the constant mu sub x squared. But the expectation of x is just mu sub x. So as often happens in this sort of proof, you have the same thing showing up once with a coefficient of plus 1, once with a coefficient of minus 2, and my conclusion is that the variance is, as advertised, the expectation of x squared minus the square of the expectation mu sub x. OK, the second part isn't much harder, but it's very important. You've known for a long time that the expectation of a sum is the sum of the expectations. And that's true without exception. Sometimes it's also true that the variance of the sum of two random variables is the sum of their variances, but that only happens when the variables are independent. Or, more strictly speaking, it only happens when they're uncorrelated. That's a consequence of independence, but a slightly weaker condition. How are we going to prove this? Well, we want to figure out the variance of x plus y. And by the rule we just came up with, that's the expectation of the square of the random variable x plus y minus the square of the expectation of x plus y. OK, we'll expand the square in the first part. That's the expectation of x squared plus 2xy plus y squared minus, and the expectation of x plus y is of course, mu x plus mu y. So I've got to subtract off the square of that. I've got to subtract off mu x squared plus 2 mu x mu y plus mu sub y squared. Now let me organize the terms. I've got an expectation of x squared minus mu sub x squared, and you'll recognize that as the variance of x. And then from this term and this term, I have the expectation of y squared minus mu sub y squared, and you'll recognize that as sigma y squared, another variance. And then I've got two more terms. I've got the expectation of 2xy minus 2 mu sub x mu sub y. And here is where I exploit independence. This is 2 times the expectation of x times the expectation of y minus 2 mu x mu y because for independent random variables, the expectation of the product is the product of the expectations. 
So this is 2 mu x mu y minus 2 mu x mu y, which is equal to 0. And that proves the result. It's easy to extend this by induction to the case of the sum of an arbitrary number of independent random variables. OK, problem three is short and sweet. What happens if we take a random variable x, and from it, we make a new random variable y by multiplying the random variable x by some real number a, and then subtracting off another real number b. And what I want to prove to you is that the effect of this is just to multiply the variance by a squared. Well, we now know the efficient way to calculate variance, the variance of random variable y is the expectation of y squared minus the square of the expectation of y. What's the expectation of y? Well, by linearity, since y is equal to ax minus b, we have the expectation of ax minus b, or a times the expectation mu x minus b. So the variance of y is the expectation of y squared. That is, it's the expectation of a squared x squared minus 2abx plus b squared. And from that, we have to subtract the square of the expectation. That is, the square of a mu x minus b. OK, first term here is just a squared times the expectation of x squared. The next term is minus 2ab times the expectation of x, which we're calling mu sub x. And the last term is the expectation of the constant random variable b squared, that is b squared. And from that, we have to subtract a squared mu sub x squared plus, because we're subtracting something negative, 2ab mu sub x minus b squared. And isn't that nice? That cancels. That cancels. And we get a squared times the expectation of x squared minus mu squared, or if you prefer, a squared times the variance of x, or we might want to write this as a squared times sigma sub x squared. So a lot of times you want to take a random variable, multiply it by some constant, subtract another constant. The effect of that on the variance is just to multiply the variance by the square of the multiplicative factor.